and one proof of B. That's all what this rule tells us. Does that make sense? There's, that's all I have, okay? So I'm going to write this. I write M colon A and N colon B, and I write the pair MN is going to prove be a proof of A and B, okay? So my basic judgment is now M colon A, and it means that M is a proof of A, or a proof term of A. Okay, so I'm going to go back and forth between saying a term of type A or a proof of A, okay? Because I'm generally going back and forth between these two points of view, um, and I'll put them here, and we'll fill that in. Okay, so here we have our prepositions, and here we have our types. So the proposition A and B as a type corresponds to a product, so it's going to be something like A cross B, right? Because it's inhabited by pairs. Okay, that's what a product type is. Okay. All right. So then what do the elimination rules correspond to? So elimination rule says from A and B we can deduce A. Okay, and so that's and elimination one. And also it says from A and B, by the second and elimination rule, we can get B. Okay, so now let's say we have an arbitrary M of type A and B. So what would be the proof of A in that case? Right, so um, we often write this as a first projection of M, okay? Now it would have been wrong to write this rule just as a side remark to say, if M comma N is a proof of A and B, then M is a proof of A, okay? And the reason this would be wrong is because not all proofs of A and B have the shape of a pair. And so we can't always apply that rule, but we always want to be able to apply that rule when we have a proof of A and B, okay? How could this, this rule fail to apply? Right. If, this is, if A and B is an assumption that I have, it's labeled okay, by some kind of a variable. I don't have an actual proof of it. I just say, assuming I have a proof of A and B. And then I couldn't apply this rule, and that would be bad because I wouldn't be able to get the component of the pair out. So we can't write it like this. We always have to write the judgment we applying the elimination rule in, in its most general form. Okay? So we can always apply the elimination rule. Otherwise, the system would become incomplete, and that would be not good. Okay, so not like that, but this way. And then here, if M is a proof of A and B, then the second component of M is going to be a proof of B. Okay, so now let's think about the local reductions, or what they correspond to. So if you want to check the soundness, we check that every introduction followed by every elimination actually can be reduced. Okay, so this is an introduction followed by this elimination. Um, so the proof term of that would be, this would indeed be a pair in that particular case. So we would get pi 1 of the pair mn, okay? And that would be a proof of A, okay? If m is a proof of A, n is a proof of B, the pair is a proof of A and B, taking the first projection gives us a proof of A, okay? Now what does a reduction do? Okay, now you have to remember back. What does our local reduction do in this case? If I, we use that proof of A, right, which we called M here. So the local reduction says this reduces to M, okay? So usually we don't write the types in, I just did to clarify. So the reduction is taking the first projection of the pair MN, reduces to M. Okay, our second local reduction says taking the second projection of the pair MN, we reduce to N, okay? Okay, so I'm just writing down on the proof terms what I just did yesterday. Okay, hopefully people can remember it well enough. Okay, questions on this? Make sense? So the local reduction we use to witness the soundness of the rules is actually a rule of computation taking the first or second component of a pair. Okay. Okay, what was our local expansion? 
That's a little bit harder to remember, so let's write it here. So if you have a proof D of A and B, okay, anybody remember how this works? If we expand it into, somebody can tell me. Right. So we take this proof of A and B and we apply the first elimination to get A and then we use it again to apply the second elimination to get B and then we reintroduce A and B. Okay? So that was our, the witness for the local completeness. We can apply the elimination rules in such a way that we can reintroduce a conjunction. Now, if this is going to be some arbitrary M, we're using it twice. We're using it here and we're using it there. Okay? And then this A is going to be the first projection of M. And this is going to be the second projection on M. And then this is going to be the pair consisting of the first projection of M together with the second projection of M. Okay? So if I write it down here, I would write something. If I have an M, which is of type A and B, then I can expand it into the pair consisting of the first component of M and the second component of M. Okay. So when we look at the operational semantics of a programming language that's based on these constructs, we'll see that these are actually computation rules because they actually reduce the term into, into smaller ones. This one is sort of an equality which says that um, you know, any term of type A and B is actually equal um, according to its type to some kind of uh, some expansion of the components. Okay. So we don't compute with that rule, but we compute with these two rules. Okay, everybody still on board with all of that? Okay, so let's go through more constructs and see what happens. Okay, so implication is the next one, natural one to look at. Okay, so the introduction rule for A implies B says, we introduce a new assumption, call it X. Then we have some proof here, which gives us B, okay? And X is available only here, that's the scope of X. All right, so when we try to assign terms to that, we say, well, there's gonna be some term M which is the proof of B. We don't know what that is. What is our proof of A? What's our proof of A? There is none, because we just make an assumption. What would be a natural way to label it? X, because we already used that X. So while we're reasoning here, we say, okay, let's have, we have some proof of A, we just assume it exists, but it's not really a closed term. So we don't really know what it is because it's just an assumption. So label that with a variable. Okay. And then the term here is going to be, okay, it's going to be lambda x m. Okay. So this is a function which if you give it a proof of A, it gives you a proof of B. So that's the way to think about it. Right? And uh, you should only be able to apply to proofs of A and it will guarantee to get proof back a proof of B. That's why we have a lambda abstraction. And the fact that this is a lambda abstraction, okay, was the essence of Howard's paper in 1969. That's the thing that he noticed, okay, that we can look at the structure of natural deductions. We can assign proof terms to them. And if you assign proof term the right way, oh, this is a lambda abstraction. The proof terms just constitute a lambda calculus, okay? Moreover, computing with that lambda calculus corresponds to the proof reductions that we know about from before. Okay, we need to look at the elimination rule. So in the most general form, if you have an M, which is a proof of A implies B, and N is a proof of A. Okay, how do we get a proof of B? Okay, substitution. Okay, that's looking ahead one step to, Farther. 
application, it's applying M applied to N. And that's going to be proof of B. Okay? So usually in functional program, you write application by juxtaposition. So we say M is applied to N, and that's our proof of B. Okay. All right, so now, now we'll come back to the other remark. So if we introduce that and then eliminate it, what does it actually look like? Okay, so let's actually write it down because we go from x colon b to m, x colon a to m colon b. And then we have lambda x dot m, which is a implies b. And then here we have an n of type a, and then we apply implication elimination, and we get lambda x dot m applied to n, that's going to be our proof of b. And now our local reduction, okay, whoops, I should justify this also like that. Okay, our local reduction says um, we take this proof here, okay, and we substitute for all assumptions over here. Okay, that's what our lo local reduction said before. So maybe I should even write the names of this in so we can remember what that was. So there's going to be some proof d here, and there's going to be some proof E here. And here we're going to have, um, okay, I haven't, don't write in the proof terms yet. We have B, then we have D, which depends on X, um, which, is, oops, which depends on A, labeled X, and we substitute E in here. So that was our previous reduction, okay? So let's put in terms, okay? So here we had previously X colon A. What would we plug in here for x colon a? What's our proof of a that we now have? N, n right? The proof e is up here, and the proof term is n, right? Because that's what e actually proves. So instead of x colon a, we have n colon a. Now instead of the proof d, what kind of a proof do we have? It's not d exactly. Right, it has to be D. Throughout D, there's going to be uses of X, and we have to substitute N for every use of X. So it's going to be N substituted for X and D. And what proof term does that give us at the bottom? It doesn't give us exactly M. It gives us N substituted for X, right, in M. Okay? And that's because the term M will also contain occurrences of x, because that's what you use throughout here. Okay. OK, so that's what we get. So we get n for x and m colon b. So if I summarize that, the local reduction is if I have lambda x m and I apply it to n, then by local reduction, I get n for x in m, Okay, which is usually called the beta rule. Yep. OK, so a proof is like a figure, right? like a two-dimensional figure. And a proof term is something that I write down here, which is either a pair, projection, lambda abstraction, or application. OK, so a proof term is a notation from which we should be able to reconstruct the two-dimensional derivation. Yeah? Yeah? That's right. OK. Other questions on this? Yeah? Is x the whole in m, n the whole in d? Yeah. Is x sort of standing for both the third and the third term? Yes. So if I were more precise on this, I would give these two different names. Just, but this is the only time we have to distinguish them, so I took a shortcut. Yeah. Right, except the substitution of E for X is denoted by this part here, because D is some kind of two-dimensional thing with X somewhere at the top. And this notation, putting E above the line, means to plug in E for X in D. OK. OK. Quest more questions? These are all good questions. OK, let's look at the local expansion, um, what that means. So we have to remind ourselves what it is. 
So we have an arbitrary proof of A implies B. OK, so it's hard to pronounce. I'll just write it down. So we're trying to find a proof of A implies B, which proceeds by implication introduction, introducing X. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, which proves B and introduces X. And I prove that from D by implication elimination. Okay? So I can apply the elimination to what I know in order to reintroduce the implication. So that's witnessing the completeness, and that was our local expansion. So let's just write in what we have. This is a proof term for A implies B. And this is a proof term for A implies B. What's the proof term for A? X, right? Because it was just an assumption. All right. What's the proof for B? It's an application of M applied to X as the proof of B. And what's the proof of A implies B now? It's lambda X. M applied to X. OK. So at this point, it becomes a little bit clear that there is some condition on this expansion that we didn't make very clear before, which is that this only makes sense if you choose an X here, which doesn't occur in the rest of the proof. Right? So this X, you have to make sure that it doesn't conflict with any other assumption that's being carried out here, okay? so that this X doesn't occur in M. Because otherwise, you would confu create confusion because of this X of type A being here, um, which has this local scope and anything that might exist in M. Okay? So the local expansion is going to be this. So it's going to be, say, if F and M, which is of type A, implies B, I can expand it into lambda X, M applied to X, with the condition that X is not in M. OK? So now we can compare these two. You know, we often think of this rule. So this is called beta, usually. And this is called eta, when you write them as equalities. Um, we can think about why these two should be equal if we think, well, extensionally. So applying this to an arbitrary argument, OK, gives us m applied to n, if we apply this to an arbitrary argument. If we apply this to an arbitrary argument, we get lambda x, m applied to x, and then applied to n, right? OK. Now what happens with that? Now this beta reduces to, well, we have to substitute n for x in m applied to x. But that's just equal to m applied to n. So if you apply m to an arbitrary argument, or if you apply lambda x, m of x to an arbitrary argument, you get the same result. Okay? And therefore, those two functions should be considered equal. Because whenever you apply them, you get the same answer. Okay? So that's a justification. And similarly for pairs, I think, if you take a pair m, a, a with b, you take the first projection, you get pi 1 of m. If you take the first projection of this pair, you get also pi 1 of m. And if you take a second projection of m here, and you take the second projection here, you get also pi 2 of m. So if you observe a pair by taking the projections, you get the same answer on both sides, and therefore the two pairs should be considered equal. OK? Everybody OK with that? So these eta rules embody a form of extensionality. Okay. Uh, OK. Um, <clears throat> any questions on what we have so far? OK, so let's complete our table here. So A implies B correspond to a function. And if you think about it as proofs, we think about it as a function from proofs of A to proofs of B. OK, so it's a function on proofs. Okay. And the way the function computes is the way we're used to. The function computes by substitution. OK. Um, Somewhere else, I should um, put a more general correspondence. OK, so we have that correspondence that propositions in logic correspond to types. OK? Um, 
Now, what does a proof in logic correspond to? Okay. It corresponds in this particular case to a lambda term, right? So proof corresponds to a term that you're computing with. Um, let's see, what does an introduction rule correspond to? What does an introduction rule correspond to? A constructor, right? Because you construct, for example, a pair. So an introduction rule corresponds to a constructor. Or here you construct a function. Okay, out of the pieces. So an intro rule is a constructor. An elimination rule, what does an elimination rule correspond to? Evaluation. Um, well, as a, term to f as a term formation thing, what does it do? It leads to evaluation, but what does it do as a, ter as a, uh, as a term formation? An accessor, or I'm going to call it a destructor, right? Because it destructs a pair into the components, or it takes a function and destructs it into the body, okay? And substitutes for the argument. So we, the intros are constructors, the elimination are destructors for types. Um, and, uh, okay, what does a reduction, a local reduction, correspond to? A step of computation, right? A computation step. Because we do a local reduction, and then we see, OK, it's a step of computation. Um, and an expansion corresponds to some equality, extensionality.